Matthew Reed is well-versed in all things military. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Army, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Reed is a former military intelligence NCO, strategic analysis, DOD contractor. He has ex experience in hostile intelligence op operations and counterintelligence and so much more. Today, Reed writes hybrid fiction, which combines the elements of techno thrillers, exotic romance, horror, urban fantasy, and of course, military sci-fi novels. His goal as an author is to engage his reader to think more critically with regards to national security threats from foreign influencers. Please welcome Matthew Reed. What was your first job in the military? So very first job, we call it an MOS, a military occupational specialty. My first job in the military when I was in the Marine Corps was an anti-tank assault man, specialized in explosives and demolitions and destroying tanks and armored vehicles. In fact, one of the primary weapons I was trained and certified on was none other than the Javelin missile, which is being used right now uh, by the Ukrainians in the war in the Ukraine to blast Russian tanks. That was my first job. Then I was a training NCO for the last couple of years I was in. Those were my first two occupations. So what was your first mission like? I imagine first you big, were nervous. Well, first, <laughs> first big mission that was significant was actually in Iraq in 2009. That was actually when I was in the Army and I was working as an interrogator. One of the reasons I see that as being so significant besides the time, it was the first time I got to do my job in Army intelligence as an interrogator doing real life interrogation <clears throat> there was one individual who i interrogated twice who was one of the top terrorists in iraq and diala province at the time a guy we'd been looking for for years and one of our cavalry squadrons just happened to roll the guy up on that they realized who they had they put him in the back of the striker vehicle they're like holy cow the intel guys want to talk to this dude so they rounded him up, and this is after the SOFA agreement had been signed with the Iraqis, so we had to actually go to an Iraqi government facility to do the interrogation, be approved by an Iraqi judge. And second interrogation I did with that guy lasted roughly seven hours and 45 minutes. Wow. For those of us are, who are not in the U.S., can you explain the difference between the Marines and the Army? Oh, sure. So Marine Corps is set up quite a bit differently. The boot camp is much more intense to the point where it's sometimes downright brutal. Um, Marine Corps has always had its own boot camp. It's the only boot camp that's recognized as being good for life by all branches of service in the United States, mostly because it's not just training. They're trying to brainwash and indoctrinate you, and the Marine Corps makes an effort to try to wash out as many people as they can. So mm -hmm. it's also a selection process. The other services don't really do that. And the Marine Corps officially falls under the Navy, but its primary purpose is an expeditionary shock troop force. For, all, for you know, oversimplification, that's pretty much what we were. Their job is to go in, kick in the door first, be the cannon fodder if necessary, and soften the enemy up as much as is humanly possible. They're far more efficient. Uh, things that took the Army 30 days to do, the Marine Corps could do like that in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different mentality, completely different setup. The Army is a ground theater warfare force designed for large-scale engagements across a lot of different types of terrain, basically designed to fight in deserts or fight in places like Europe much bigger, a lot more firepower, but also slower and less efficient. Now, those are probably the primary differences. Intelligence is something, and we're hearing a lot more about it these days, sure. but it's something that cannot be nurtured overnight, can it? How would you assess how complicated it can be? <laughs> intelligence involves a lot of different things. Okay, it involves human intelligence, which in over kind of oversimplification here, but it involves interrogation and running of what are called human intelligence sources at different different categories. Category one being sources that might be officers, colonels, or generals in a foreign military or even a foreign head of state. 
that's usually handled by people in three letter agencies like the CIA. The military will run what they call category three and category two, where we might recruit mid-level people in a terrorist organization or an insurgent organization or organized crime. We recruit people who have access to information we need mm -hmm. and try to convince them to work for us and spy on their own nation, spy on their buddies. That's one part of intelligence. Counterintelligence is stopping other intelligence services from doing that type of human intelligence collection, whether reactively or proactively. Then we have more sophisticated forms of intelligence. We have people who have said, you know, signals intelligence, which we hear about with the American NSA. Then you have imagery intelligence, which comes down to satellite intelligence, imagery from drones. Then you have more high stuff like what they call ELINT or electromagnetic intelligence. That's strictly a strategic level type of intelligence. That'd be using things like reconnaissance aircraft with special gadgets and gear on them to collect yeah. information on, say, Russian nuclear tests, Russian missile tests, and then taking that back so that us and our closest allies, like the Aussies, the Brits, and the Canadians, can sit down and say, okay, here's where our data show. Let's figure out just what the heck we're dealing with here. And then you have your analysts involved that help tell us what we're looking at. And then at higher echelons, other analysts look at it again and say, okay, yes, the Russians can do this. They have this capability. No, they don't. Or this terrorist group's intent is to most likely attack this naval base mm -hmm. or no, it isn't. It's kind of an oversimplification, but I think it's yeah. kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah, it is it is pretty in-depth. History does seem to be repeating itself with the Cold War, fascism, pogroms, and all of that. How do you see that? Is it repeating itself? Is there, or is it different this time? It's actually both. So to understand what's going on in Europe, we've got to have an understanding of European history. So Ever since the disintegration of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, which followed the disintegration of their legions and their military in the 4th century AD, up from that point in time up until 1945, Europe was in a constant state of never-ending war between tribes, between nobles, between nation-states. What stopped that force of history in 1945 was in the 19th century, the Europeans, Brits, the French, the Germans, had to go out and build empires. That's why, because they had to get massive amounts of raw materials and natural resources to feed their new industrial bases. Well, oversimplification again, but you get the picture. Yeah. And of course, they end up fighting over things that eventually culminates in World War I, then World War II. The whole thing's blown to hell. The U.S. and her allies end up in control of Western Europe, the Red Army in the East, and the combination of, you know, the American and British occupation of Germany and Western Europe and the Russian occupation of Eastern Europe stopped more or less the wheel of history. What the United States did, and analysts like Peter Zihon have summed this up very well, we took a look at the Red Army and we said, okay, that's a serious fighting force right there. We were not sure we could beat them if we actually got into a fight. George S. Patton thought he could, but we know he got you know, most likely assassinated. Uh, he may or may not have been right or wrong, but George Marshall and Eisenhower didn't think we could do it. And so we look at the, what the Red Army was able to do, the sheer number of people they kill and the casualties that the Russians were able to sustain and still steamroll over Eastern Europe. We didn't think we could beat them. So we said, okay, what do we do? So we made the Europeans a deal. I said, look, guys. We're going to use the United States Navy to secure all the world's sea lanes so that you guys can import raw materials and export a finished product to the North American market. And you won't have to build big militaries or empires again because the U.S. Navy is going to do for you what your empire would have done. That's why ever since 1945, the primary use for the U.S. Navy and to a lesser extent the Marine Corps was to eliminate piracy and secure those sea lanes, mm -hmm. which is why... Anytime some group of knuckleheads attacked a major sea lane or went after one of our allies' trade, we responded like that and we smacked them pretty hard. We wanted to set that up so that they could rebuild their economies. And then, of course, comes the United States' famous deal with the devil, with the Saudis, who we really underestimated just what yeah. a problem they could be. So 
we said, look, we'll secure the Persian Gulf so we can get cheap Middle Eastern oil from the Saudis to basically fuel nations like South Korea, Japan, and the Western Europeans to rebuild their economies so that they could build reasonably sized militaries to hold back the communists, hold back the Red Army. The best analysis on that still comes from Peter Zai. He just sums it up better. I'm still oversimplifying, but that was what we did. Right. Now, the deal was the United States will do all this for you. We'll even fight wars for it, which is kind of what we did in Desert Storm. But you got to be on our side and you have to let the United States write your security policy because the last time we let you Europeans do things on your own, some guy who yells Zeke Heil comes to power and then we're ginned up in a war that kills tens of millions. So we don't want that to happen again. The Europeans are like, okay, where do we sign? So that's where NATO comes from. And the whole reason was to hold back the Russians. And there were other problems. The United States was not energy independent and the Saudis could still kind yeah. of yank our chain. Well, we fast forward a few decades. As of 2019, the North American continent, the U.S. and Canada, pretty much 100% energy independent. They got all the energy options they need in their own borders. So why would we care what happens in the Middle East? We start drawing down, draw a lot of our forces out of Europe. Then certain things start to happen, and then the Europeans start to act like Europeans again. So, best example, as the Cold War progressed, we tried to go, instead of so much energy independence, we tried to have a crash program between the U.S., Canada, Britain, and Germany, and the French to go nuclear, basically meaning all of our electricity generated by nuclear power. Mm -hmm. The only country that was successful was the French. The reason the others failed is because the Russians ran a very effective subversion operation. A lot of the anti-nuclear weapon, anti-nuclear movement, we've always suspected some of the leaders were Russian sleepers. They mm -hmm. fanned the flames. The reason was is the only export the Russians could make money off of was exporting oil and gas. So that was an existential threat to them, and they responded appropriately. Well, the United States didn't like that too much. So when President Reagan came to power, we had a three-pronged way of bringing the Russians to their knees. One was the conventional military buildup to make sure they didn't think they could take us in a conventional fight. Two was the Star Wars program. And three, and probably most importantly, we cut some deals with the Saudis to give their royal family U.S. military protection in exchange for them crashing oil prices. That crippled the Soviet Union's economy and ultimately is what contributed to them going to their knees in 1992. But then we have other problems. Yeah. The nuclear weapons trafficking issue becomes a thing, and the Russians have a 60% drop in birth rate like that almost overnight. Millions of people die from alcoholism, tuberculosis, which is still happening, and millions of young, good-looking Russian women flee, either flee the country or are trafficked out as mail-order brides or to work in the brothels of Western Europe. And the Western European governments liked all the tax revenue from those brothels, so they told their counterintelligence services, turn a blind eye to what they did wow. now run this forward a few decades how does that decimate a country's population well it's gotten to the point where as of right now russians are dying off as a people quite literally yeah uh, without the, the ukrainians help <laughs> yeah that's it's one of the reasons that made the russians do what they do so the russians are dying off to the point where by the by wow. our projections in u.s army europe I haven't heard the, anyone say that before. The news media doesn't give people good information at all. It's just all propaganda and virtue signaling. Nobody learns anything. But the Russians are at the point where by the end of this decade, by, by our projections, when I worked as a counterintelligence analyst in U.S. Army Europe for a number of years, up until fairly recently, they're not going to be able to field a military or security forces even half the size of the one they have now. Wow. And the Russians, look at their history and geography. They've been invaded multiple times going back since before Napoleon from the West. So in the Russian mindset, because of their experiences and the fact that they lost 27 million people in World War II, and that cannot help but scar someone, whether they're communist or not. So what that does, they look at that border a certain way. In the Russian mindset, it is an existential threat to the Russian people and the Russian state if they can't somehow control that border. Problem is, in the Russian mindset to control that border, they've got to have Ukraine, if not just that, 
parts of Eastern Europe to give themselves strategic depth. It's uh, basically now or never. So when the Russians yeah. were building up in the Ukraine, I was still working in the Balkans. I told them I didn't think the Russians were bluffing. I said, they can't afford to do this and bluff, guys. In their mm. minds, this is an existential issue. And now it's probably beyond that. Like it's, oh, it's, it's a whole lot of things. Now it's saving face. It's, they can't go back. No, they can't. It's, here's where it gets to be an interesting problem at where it ties into history repeating itself in Europe. So you might notice when we had the first wave of Muslim migrant refugees come in from the Middle East a few years ago, a few hundred thousand of them, you saw the right wing parties in some countries make major gains and almost take the prime ministerships of Germany, the Netherlands and France and to a lesser extent Italy. So what the war in the Ukraine is going to do, if nothing else changes, let me caveat that, is a lot could happen between the next, now and the next few years. Right. But unless something changes, Ukraine's agriculture will be wrecked for probably over a decade. Problem is, Ukraine's one of the world's top exporters of fertilizers, mm -hmm. wheat, and grain. The parts of the world that are extremely dependent on that are parts of the Middle East and Africa. So unless something changes, you're looking at mass famine and starvation exactly. in those areas. What that will most likely do if nothing changes is drive tens of millions of African and Arab migrants right into the heart of Europe. It'll be the biggest inward migration since the disintegration of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, and that's big. It might collapse some of those European countries into civil war, strain their health care systems. Now, when that starts to happen to people like the French and the Germans, their backs get put to the wall. How do they tend to respond and behave? Well, we in U.S. Army Europe talked this over and we figured, okay, only a handful of courses of action. One, they're overrun and destroyed, which suits Russia's strategic interest because it destroys a chunk of NATO. And Germany is NATO's primary logistics hub, which the Russians have not failed to notice. So <laughs> that's one possibility. Next one is right-wing parties come to power and they fight it out, maybe capitulate later. Or three, the right-wing parties come to power, they strip off the later hose and the jackboots come back on. And we might see ethnic cleansing on a scale we haven't seen since the yeah. Holocaust and World War II. Now, on the surface, people might say, okay, those right-wing parties, some are up. I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but some right. of their members are anti-NATO, some are not. Some are pro-American, some are pro-Russian, but there's the problem. Those parties come to power, it's highly likely that given how many of them have expressed pro-Russian or pro-Putin sympathies, that the Russians end up in control of the parliaments of France, which is a nuclear power. Uh -oh. How scary is that? Oh, it is. Netherlands and Germany. And if nothing else, they destroy half of NATO and basically slice it in half, yeah. which puts the U.S., Canada, and Britain in one hell of a bind if we have to respond. And the Russian security services, they know exactly what they're doing. In fact, it's most yeah. likely the security services that are controlling the war because they're expending a lot of firepower simply to destroy Ukraine's agriculture, even though right now it doesn't impact their military that much because of all the supplies we're giving them. So the Russians are thinking a couple steps ahead. So they can more or less either wreck it or end up in control of it one way or the other. We also have the aspect right now of Iran getting involved. North Korea has talked about getting involved. So where does China fit in? Iran has been supplying the drones, but if these other countries step in, do you think NATO will finally put boots in the ground and air and sea? Ooh. I mean, or are they just going to let this happen and, and let everybody roll over Ukraine into Europe? <sighs> well, it becomes kind of a complicated issue. Let me try to address the elements that are making it complicated. One school of thought, and this might be the dominant school of thought at U.S. European Command and at NATO headquarters is, the Russians have got one serious weakness, and that's logistics. They've always sucked at that. And so the logistics network they set up for the war in the Ukraine, most of it was being run off of nothing but rail lines. No yeah. troop transports, no trucks, no very little air transport. And rail lines, you can destroy a rail line with a hand grenade that derails a train. It really is that easy. That's what they did. Yeah. But because really? of that, and knowing <laughs> the Russians have a limited ability to use their logistics to project that kind of power, 
we're hitting them where it hurts the most, which is their logistics to try to basically maybe starve and kill off their army, maybe. Uh, and so that school of thought becomes, okay, we can train the Ukrainians up, we can supply them with things like the Javelin missile, which I can tell you is just absolute hell on anything with tracks or wheels, an incredible weapon system, easy to use, easy to train someone to do. We can supply them with weapons like that and bleed the Red Army to death slowly in a NATO-US-backed proxy war without yeah. putting boots on the ground where we end up pushing the Russians too far and maybe they go to nukes. That's the danger. And then St. Petersburg is... Possibly. It would, it would depend on what kind of nukes the Russians use and how we choose to retaliate. The idea may be let's bleed them to death with a proxy war without putting boots on the ground and we can gradually bleed them to death and maybe get them to the negotiating table that way without risking, you know, a, a nuclear So why would you negotiate with a terrorist? Well, in Putin's case... And why case, would Ukraine... Ukraine is not going to negotiate the, any of their territory. Well, they may not want to, but it, de <clears throat> it all depends on what happens in the next few years. People sometimes look at Russia and they think the guy at the top, Putin, is really in charge. He's not. The people who are really in charge are the Russian security services. And that comes down to a handful of people, one of whom is Alexander Bortnikov, the head of the FSB. I used to put together files on that guy when I was a counterintelligence wow. analyst. He's probably more ruthless than Putin, and he's probably smarter. They both came up to the KGB together back in yeah. the day. There's him. I can't remember who the new head of the Russian GRU, Russian military intelligence is. Then there's Igor Sechin, the guy who runs Gazprom pretty loathsome, unpleasant individual, but negotiations would probably have to take place with those guys if it was going to happen. Now, as far as why they would negotiate, it comes down to the fact that Russia is the only other tier one strategic nuclear weapons power besides the United States. Now, the only nuclear power that has the ability to fire off intercontinental ballistic missiles and flatten most of Europe and Mm -hmm. a good chunk of the U.S., depending on how many of their missiles get through our defenses. So it may be one of those things where we bleed them to death and get them to the negotiating table first, where maybe we can dictate terms that are more favorable to what the United States, the West, and the Ukraine want. And what and costs, though? Well, it'll, it'll be costly in the I long mean, run, depending on how... It's not going to solve anything. We're just going to be here in the same place in 10 years. <laughs> Well, maybe, but maybe not. Because remember, the Russians are dying off as a people. If it goes on long enough, it'll get to the point where the Russians may have no choice but to just deal so they can pull in their horns. Now, here's the long-term problem. This is probably why we haven't pulled all of our assets out of Eastern Europe. So when the Russians finally do die off, probably 2040s, 2050s ballpark figure, here's the problem. What happens to the thousands upon thousands of high yield nuclear warheads they have when they can't secure any of them anymore? Because you yeah. got to have a military and security forces to do that. So, thinking strategically long term, why the United States and maybe the intelligence community and the higher ups at NATO want to keep US assets in Eastern Europe, close to the Ukraine, and in Scandinavian countries like Finland? is when the Russians finally collapse and go under, we're going to have to have assets in place to grab up all those nukes before, God forbid, some crazy yeah. people get a hold of them. And you can bet there's going to be a lot of people trying to get yeah. their They're hands They're probably on already them. starting. <laughs> well, there's, if there's any forward-thinking insurgent groups that plan on being around in a few oh, decades, yeah. this is probably what they're thinking. If there's one thing we've learned about uh, dump bags is they're, they're lying wait, ready to pick the bones. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so there's so much going on at once. We also have the climate emergency. It is an emergency. I don't think anybody's going to take it seriously in the Western countries until they see their neighbors become climate refugees. What kind of national security risk is it? Depends on a lot of different factors. We've assessed it for the United States and North America, not near as bad as most people think. Where it will get bad is places that are already prone to flooding, lower to sea level, 
London might have a little bit of flooding. I don't know if they can build a seawall or not. Might have to think about it. But we do have technologies that are going to be able to mitigate that, even though it has, isn't being covered by the news media. Yeah. Let, me, let, let me explain. So long story short, over the last mm, seven or eight years or so, the Department of Energy in the U.S. intelligence community is making an effort to take what used to be called black program technologies related to energy and try to push those through the regulatory commissions and out to the private sector. Now, these are things like small modular nuclear reactors that are comparable to what we've had on our nuclear submarines since the 1950s. We've had the technology to generate electricity from small nuclear power plants since the 50s. It was just classified technology. We couldn't get it pushed out because of various regulatory issues. But a whole lot of these new modular nuclear technologies, they're completely different technologies in many ways from what we think of nuclear power plants. They're portable. You can have one, string them together. All that stuff is being tested by the DOD and the U.S. Army. They're picking up about 100% of the development and testing costs. Plan is push a lot of that out to the private sector, and that's how we'll be able to generate most of our energy and electricity. And shale oil and gas, with shale oil, shale gas in particular, has already contributed to slowly dropping emissions just because shale's cleaner, because when they take it, this only happens in North America, the U.S. and Canada, because if we have some unique geology, when you take that stuff out, you're taking it straight from the rock strata, whereas traditional oil, for example, which is we call it heavy sour, what makes it polluting is that as it comes up through the ground, it picks up all those toxins and pollutants like sulfur. We can never completely get rid of them. Shale gas, on the other hand, it's just pure gas and it's pretty clean. We just haven't built out our infrastructure yet to take advantage of that. And then all the modular nuclear power plants. And then there's another technology Lockheed Martin's pushing called the compact fusion reactor. We could talk for hours about that thing, <laughs> but it's coming in under the radar. And unless you read defense and technology publications like Aviation Week and Space Technology, the drive.com, Defense One, unless you read those three publications, it's all coming in under the radar but it is all being made to happen. So yeah. a lot of these technologies will be addressing that and oh, we'll be able to good. deal with it. That's good. Um, I got to talk to you about your books. When did you sure. decide to start writing and take all this knowledge and your experience to put it into oh. books? I first tried writing an actual novel when I was about my last year, year and a half in the Marine Corps and had the book published for a while. The publishing company went out of business and actually has a class action suit against the former oh, owners no. of Maryland. All of a sudden, I'm like, why is my book selling more? I look, I'm like, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> so I pulled that off and I've written about <clears throat> six novels and novellas, including one short story collection through the Amazon Kindle Direct publishing mm -hmm. platform still available on Amazon. The first book I wrote, it's about 509 pages, I think. And it's called, <laughs> oh yeah. It's a long one. It's called In the Death of Night 2.0. And what that's about, it's about a retired CIA case officer who manipulates and leverages a major Russian organized crime group into killing terrorists in Houston, Texas that have percolated into the Texas Gulf Coast to target our oil and gas refining infrastructure in the event of a war. And now using organized crime to go after terrorists it's not really a new concept. The United States yeah. actually did this in the Second World War. We cut a deal with Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, right. and Sam Giancana to kill off all the German and Italian foreign exchange students and anybody we thought was a German or Italian operative such that by 1943, neither the Italians nor the German Gestapo would let their agents fly into a North American airport because they were dead 24 hours later. <laughs> and the, F the FBI would come in and just kind of sweep it under the rug, get rid of the bodies. And in fact, that uh, use of organized crime, the Sicilian mob, is what made our invasion of Sicily such a stunning success because the mob yeah. controlled the island and they were able to create a human intelligence network for us overnight that allows to infiltrate the island and pull a fast one on the Germans. So... That book is, uh, it's done reasonably well for an independently published book. Uh, the concept of how it's done is pretty simple. In the book, the CIA case officer, Bill Carpenter, 
has a firm called Mercury Securities that contracts to do bug sweeping for listing devices for the Houston police, FBI, all the federal agencies in Houston. He hides those listing devices he's supposed to be looking for, knows everything the cops and the feds are doing, tells the Russians, I can tell you if, when, how, why, and where the cops and the feds are going to move on you way in advance on one condition. I got all this surveillance data on known or suspected terrorists from overseas that are in Houston. You have your ex spetsnaz GRU enforcers and trigger men. Kill them. Whatever it costs you to do the operation, I spot you for in cold, hard cash. You don't lose a dime. What do you say? <laughs> these are these are kinds of stories I actually love. These are the movies and TV shows and books I just dive into. So these your books sound amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wrote. I also wrote a very sci-fi time travel thriller called The Time Killer. It's been pretty well reviewed. But it's about U.S. intelligence operatives who are Gen Xers like I am, going back in time to the late 80s, early 90s, to prevent a future war between the U.S. and China and the devastating aftermath. They're going back in time to kill the four people who are responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So I took my turn at writing some Terminator-esque fiction there. <laughs> So how many books in total do you have? Oh, six total, including the novellas. So there's In the Death of Night 2.0, The Time Killers, The Jackals of Babylon 2020 is a short story collection. And then I have a short novella collection called the West Timers Children series. And that's in relation to an area in Houston called the West Timer Corridor, where all the massage parlors and strip clubs are. Oh, at. okay. And when I was in between the Marine Corps and the Army, I was actually working as a doorman at one of those strip <laughs> clubs. So it gave me a lot to write about, and I obviously took advantage of that. No kidding. <laughs> so what's next for you? Do you have any more books on your plate? I do. I have a, a manuscript I'm writing for another book. It's going to be a counter-espionage thriller. I just got that back from the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, a few days ago. Because of my, because I still hold an active security clearance with the United States government. Oh, so you got to be careful write, about what you write. <laughs> when I write certain types of books, if they get into intelligence community territory or what we call TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, I have to give them a copy of the manuscript so that they can review it. And only had a handful of redactions. I was surprised given how detailed I went in certain things related to counterintelligence. But that's what's in the works right now. That's very cool. I could talk to you for hours, <laughs> but mm. thank you so much. This is no, awesome. No I'm so grateful. Thank you so much.